most beautiful parts of life. And something that takes up a huge part of childhood would be board games. I'm sure you all recognize this board game, Snakes and Ladders. What's the main aim of the game? To move from square one to square hundred the fastest. Whoever reaches square hundred the fastest is the winner. Now, let's tweak the game a little. Let's see. The aim is not to reach square hundred the fastest, but the aim is for all the players or all the game pins to reach square hundred. So even if one of the players does reach square hundred, you would have to go back to square one to get all the other players back up. Now, let's look at this from the perspective of a country. Let's say the Snakes and Ladders board is a country and your game pins or your players are parts of the population. So what's the aim of the country? To get its entire population from square one, which is poverty, to square hundred, which is prosperity. But this journey from poverty to prosperity is not very straightforward. You do have a lot of snakes and ladders that come in between. Ladders are those things which accelerate the movement of people towards prosperity. So this could be improved education, improved health care. So all of those things which can make the population richer. Snakes, on the other hand, are those things which decelerate the movement of people towards prosperity or bring them closer to poverty. So this could be political instability, natural disasters, war, famine. Right now, there's a huge snake that's threatening the lives of millions around the world. I'm sure you might have guessed it by now. It's COVID-19. According to the World Bank, COVID-19 is expected to push 40 to 60 million people into extreme poverty. To put things into perspective, this is more than the population of Canada and it's 10 times the population of Singapore. So all of these people are going back to square one. Now, if you want to get these people back on track in the journey from poverty to prosperity, you do need ladders which accelerate this movement, right? So there are many, many ladders which could be used to solve this purpose. But one ladder which has really, really inspired me and which I'm going to talk about today would be the ladder of microfinance. Microfinance, as the word suggests, revolves around small money, micro money. This concept was founded by Muhammad Yunus with the aim of providing the poor with the financial services that the conventional banks deprive them of. Conventional banks still provide the small loans or loans without documents which the poor actually need. But microfinance solves this problem. It involves dividing the poor into groups and dividing the sum of money amongst them. This money can then be used by the poor in order to assist them in the financial services they require. But microfinance though has been used in various countries in order to solve the problem of poverty, there have been certain places where it has failed or certain instances in which people are just not ready to use this as a possible ladder. A reason why people may not be inclined towards using microfinance in order to help the poor of the society is because it revolves around the concept of trust. Trust is a lost concept in today's world, right? No one trusts anyone easily, especially when it comes to lending the poor a sum of money without any documentation, collateral, or without any proof that they can pay you back the money along with the interest. No one's going to give them the money. Therefore, no one's willing to use microfinance. So if there's more trust in the society, could microfinance work? Probably, maybe. But even when microfinance was implemented, there have been instances where it has failed. A reason for this is microfinance is simply meant to the poor who have absolutely no skills as to how they can effectively use that money and potentially multiply it in future. So all they do is take the money that they get through microfinance in order to satisfy their day-to-day -day expenditure and the money remains the same. It doesn't multiply. So what they may end up doing is, in fact, borrowing from another microfinance institution in order to pay back their previous debts. So again, they're stuck in the cycle of taking loans. 
but no idea or concept can be perfect, right? What makes it perfect is you identify the negatives, you identify the disadvantages, and tailor a completely new concept. So many organizations around the world have tried to do that, and one such organization is the Arunaga Trust. The Arunaga Trust is located in Tindalveli, Tamil Nadu. The word Arunaga in Tamil means the blooming of a bud. This is symbolic of their efforts, their aim of the holistic development of the society. So this NGO offers many programs which aim at the sustainable development of the society and one such program is the microfinance program. So in the microfinance program, women of similar economic status, women around the same area form groups called self-help groups or SHGs. In these self-help groups, each member contributes around 100 to 200 rupees every month and each member gets the chance to borrow a fixed sum of money every month. The sum of money that they borrow, they use it for um, their day-to-day -day expenditure or starting a business of their own. I actually had the opportunity to witness this program working and to witness the amazing impact this program had on the population, on the society, as I worked as an intern for this organization. My experience was very, very enriching and inspiring, and I would like to share a few very inspiring stories from my experience with you all. On the second day of my internship, when I was just sitting on the desk, drawing the graphs on the amount of loan taken by each SHG each month, a woman back walks in with a bag full of sarees. It's quite common to see people moving from house to house or lane to lane trying to sell their products in India, so I thought it's just another woman trying to do that. But she seemed to be very, very friendly with the people of the NGO. Only a little later did I realize that she's actually a member of one of the SHGs, self-help groups of the NGO, and she used the money that she got through microfinance in order to start her own side business. So in this case, what the NGO did was, it helped the woman identify her innate skills, her innate passion for sarees, and she used microfinance to start her own profitable business. This made me realize the importance of helping women identify their skills in addition to providing microfinance. Just providing microfinance is just not going to work. Apart from working at the office, I also had the opportunity to visit the workshop of the NGO. And this is where I say the magic happens. I say that because this is a place which acts as a tool to help the women learn how they can multiply the money that they receive through microfinance. So at this workshop, the NGO trains the women in two main things, bag making and sanitary napkin making. As for the bag making, the women are taught how they can use simple everyday tools like a sewing machine, the base material for a bag, a zip, a few decorative items, and they can start a huge business of their own. One of the SHGs started a huge bag making business which now sells to students across schools, people across the village. And now, in fact, one of the members of the SHG comes down to train and inspire other women to start similar businesses. So in this case, the women didn't have any innate skills, but they acquired new skills. And with these new skills they acquired, they could start a huge profitable business of their own and become financially independent and empowered. This itself is a very, very impactful program which was offered by the NGO. But another program which is way more impactful at a much larger scale would be the Sanitary Napkin Program. In this first program, the NGO bought a few machines which are required for making sanitary napkins. The self-help group members are taught how to use these machines. They use microfinance to rent out these machines and they make low-cost affordable sanitary napkins. In this case, not only did microfinance help them start a business which would help them financially, but it also helped them understand the demands of the society. 
in the rural in the society in rural india people don't have the access to a very basic sanitary need like sanitary napkins without this many women suffer and die of infections every year so in this case not only do the sanitary napkins help the women financially but it also creates a larger impact of them supplying to the demands of the society they now supply to five hospitals to 100 other shg groups and many other rural women promoting health and hygiene among them so i think that this is one program which had a very very huge impact and this is one of the programs which made me realize the power that microfinance holds so after my internship experience i realized that there is an ngo which works towards the rural community and they are solely working towards social service but not all of us are going to start an ngo of our own right not all of us want to go into social services we all have our own dreams and aspirations but what can i do what can you do what can we all do about the people in square one what can we do in our respective fields can we do something when these questions were going around in my mind i came across a few people and i would like to share my their stories with you all this is orthopedic surgeon in india who works in the city and each and every year he dedicates a few days in order to organize a completely free orthopedic camp for the rural people of india in this camp he provides free treatment free um, crutches artificial limbs wheelchairs all of these for the people who have been victims of accidents or who have or the kids who have polio so the rural people just don't have enough money to access these very very basic healthcare needs that they would need in order to make their life better but by sacrificing even just a few days of your life you can make a huge impact in the lives of the poor but you would say in healthcare it's quite straightforward provide free treatment provide free medicines and you're done but what about the other fields did you think about fashion designing can you still make an impact in that field you actually can there's a fashion designer in india a very very well known and successful fashion designer who has a separate fashion line which sells clothes which are hand crafted by the rural women of india in this case these rural women felt uplifted and financially independent they got a sense of identity so if they can why can't we this made me realize that no matter which field we are in what can we not do for the people of the poor maybe a few days of our lives we have the ability to make an impact so let's look at a few other fields now law what can you do if you're a lawyer you can provide free legal consultation for the poor the poor have the basic right of fighting for their rights as a lawyer you could fight for that if you are a performing artist what could you do you could organize exhibitions and shows which use the skills of the poor or you could just use that as a medium of spreading awareness amongst them so no matter what field you are in you have the ability to create ladders you have the ability to make the ladders for the people in square one so now as we think about what we want to do in future let's think about how we can make a difference let's let's think about how we can create those ladders to lift the people in square one and help move them towards square 100 let's make those same lower ladders just like the ngo did they identified the needs of the society and they created a tailor ladder for the society We should do that too, no matter which field we are in. But for that, we have to go back to square one. Thank you.